Once again, we can read Lord's Day 50 on uh, the Lord's Prayer, the fourth petition. I'll read that together with you. Page 562 of your book of praise. What is the fourth petition? Give us this day our daily bread. That is, provide us with all our bodily needs so that we may acknowledge that you are the only fountain of all good and that our care and labor and also your gifts cannot do us any good without your blessing. Grant, therefore, that we may withdraw our trust from all creatures and place it only in you. It's for the reading of the Catechism. Congregation of Christ, last week we started looking at Lord's Day 50. Pray for our daily bread. We ask God the Father to provide the food that we need for the day ahead. It is right to ask the Father for food because ultimately all food, money, shelter, life comes from the Father. But now we have a second sermon on Lord's Day 50. In this sermon, I want to deal with a question that last week's sermon might create. The question goes like this. If God provides all of our food, why do we still have to work? What place does our work have in God's provision of food? Do Christians have to work? Should we? And the Catechism talks about this. You can see that if you read the Catechism, it talks about our care and labor and also your gifts cannot do us any good without your blessing. And so the Catechism also references our work as part of how the Father feeds us. But what is this connection? Where does our work fit in and how? And of course, if you live in this culture, you'll know that our culture has many answers to this question. For some in our culture, they say that work and achievement, especially the work of career and making things or having or um, cultivating food, etc., that's everything, in fact. My identity is work, and beyond work, nothing really of value happens in my life. In fact, I, I only rest so that I have more energy for my work. And in my own life, I worked with many people like this, particularly in the political world or in the business world or in university. This was a pervasive attitude, especially in places like downtown Toronto and places like that. But others in our culture take the opposite approach. They think that work is only a means to an end. Leisure is what we're really meant to do. We're meant to have fun and to express ourselves in various activities and pursuits, and work is just a necessary evil. We put up with work because we have to. Our world, and our world is not perfect enough for us to eliminate work, and so we have to still work. And in fact, in many of the part-time jobs that I worked on in construction or warehouses and whatnot, this was a pervasive attitude. The general attitude of many of my coworkers, and I'm sure many of you see this, is that work is just this ugly thing that we have to get through so that I can go home and play video games or whatever. But what does the Bible say? What are Christians supposed to think about work? And today I want to work through a, a series of biblical passages. I'm, I actually intended to go through far more, but I'm, I'll limit myself today. A series of passages of what I'm going to call a theology of work. And the first passages I want to look at are Genesis 1 and 2. And the question we want to ask in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, which we read earlier, is... Did work exist in perfection, in paradise, in a sinless state? Because if it did, then it stands to reason that work is good and good for us. And if you look at Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 2, we see a, a mention of work 
where it says here, by the seventh day, God had finished the what? Work. He had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And then at the end of verse 3, you'll see he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. And so right away in Genesis, we begin to realize that work is good. And the word for, because God himself does it. And the word for work here is the Hebrew word malaka. And it basically means craftsmanship. It means to create objects, to fashion things of formless matter into things with form that are useful. And this word can also sort of mean trade, like having a trade like carpentry. And you could say maybe God's trade is to be a creator. God himself works. He creates. He makes things. And maybe we could say the opposite. God is not idle when something can be created and made that is useful for those he loves. And so here we have a definition of work right from the outset. And I owe a little bit of this to Tim Keller. What is work? Well, work is to make or create or fashion things from formlessness into form that are useful for the flourishing of the community. So the world is created out of formless matter and a useful, luxurious, verdant world is created out of the formless thing that, that existed before creation. And that, in essence, is the, the model of what work is for everybody. We are all doing that, even teachers, pastors. Teachers are teaching children. There's a, this sort of raw material, and the teachers are forming and fashioning and bringing knowledge to form a more useful student, in a sense. Everybody's doing this. That's number one. Or this is the first part of our, our Genesis investigation. The second thing I want to comment on in Genesis 1 and 2 is that God then creates man in his image to also work. And there are two ways in which man works on earth. And the first one you find is in verse 27 in the famous the image of God, he created them. And then verse 28, God says, gives man a command. Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And this is a, a job for us. It's a, it's a task for us to fill out. That's the first thing. The second thing you find in Genesis uh, 2 verse 15 where it says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it and take care of it. And so man is given a task to do in paradise. And we presume that work at this time is pleasurable and enjoyable and useful and blessed in every way. And now also note what man's work is. It's actually the definition of work is far wider than what we would be used to. Man's work is to be fruitful. So the work of having children is part of the work that, we're, that we do. We don't just go to a job site for 40 hours a week and pound out, you know, dig holes or whatever you do for your 40 hours a week or drive a truck or whatnot. We also, our work at home of having children is part of our work. And also subduing the earth. And so you, there you get almost a, an agricultural metaphor in a sense. Man has to do things with the earth in order for the earth to produce its maximum bounty. And this is a curious, this is one comment here. The modern habit we have of thinking that our job as humans is to leave nature alone is not really scriptural. Certainly, we've done so much damage to this earth that it makes sense that we would say, you know what, we should stop touching nature because we do so much damage to it. Okay. But strictly speaking, the earth, according to the Bible, will not reach its full potential unless men tends it. And the earth is meant to serve man as God's representative on earth. 
And actually in 2 verse 15, it also says that man has to take care of it. And actually this word is a word for guarding and keeping. Man is meant to guard the earth from evil, which he fails to do. But let me see. And uh, Genesis, the final thing I want to say about Genesis is this. In Genesis shows us that we can't say that leisure is our natural state. Work is what we're meant to do. And work is good. And it's fundamental to the flourishing of this earth as man's work in it. Man has a responsibility to work. Now, this begs the question, why then is our work that so many of us have done for the last five to six days, why is it so miserable half the time or most of the time? Why is work so painful? Well, this is the fall in Genesis 3. When man fell into sin, God cursed work for both men and women. He cursed the work of men. He says in verse, uh, what it says here, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. And then Genesis 3 verse 17, By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food. And so in paradise we assume that the trees just gave fruit and food easily and it was just there for the taking and it took very little sort of effort or maybe even the effort that it took to harvest food in, in Eden in paradise was pleasurable. But now that's not the case. To eat, you've got to coax food out of an earth that's going to resist you. Work is still good, but it's toilsome. Woman's work is also cursed. I will make your, chain, pain, or your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Now, incidentally, this, this verse challenges us pretty hard as a modern culture because it shows us that contrary to popular opinion in our culture, having babies is fundamental to being a woman, whether we like it or not. And ironically, the modern term for woman, birthing people, which is what people want to say, makes this point in sort of an ironic way. But the task of being a mother is now painful because of sin. Again, not diminished or less noble or less good, just painful. And again, the point is, the fall into sin does not eliminate work or destroy it. It just makes it difficult. And work is necessary still, too. That's number two. So number three, the Bible assumes that every believer must work for a living and commands it, in fact. The most explicit such command is in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, where it says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. Listen to what Paul says. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And then, even when we were with you, we gave you this rule, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. It's 2 Thessalonians 3, if you want to look at it later. Now, we notice it's very interesting what it says. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. There are those among us who are, not, who are willing to work but not able. That's okay. God does not ask from us what we're not able to do. And it, it, in fact, it's on us able-bodied members to earn enough to provide for those of us who are not able. In fact, that's all the more reason why the able-bodied should work. And Paul forbids idleness and he connects it to being disruptive. The two go hand in hand. We get into trouble when we don't have a job to do, when we don't have a purpose, when we don't have useful things to create for the benefit of others. And I wonder here, if there's a few cultural habits here that I, I wonder about sometimes. One of them is the, how we think about retirement. I think 
we often think of our retirement as the completion of our working years. Is that so? It makes sense to me that we retire from maybe our occupation at the time, or maybe we slow down in our work, or maybe we shift our life into doing something more that's maybe something we more want to do versus our job maybe was not something we love to do. That makes sense. But the idea that I'm 65, my work is done, now it's society's job to serve me, and I'm going to go to Florida and live on a golf course and forget my family and my children, they, they can all stuff it. This attitude is widespread and completely inappropriate for Christians. Just because you've turned 65 doesn't mean you're calling to serve the community and serve your family and serve all these, and to give and even maybe to produce. Yes, still there. And it's for you to judge where that's going to go. I don't know what to, you should do, but the idea that retirement is the end of work is, I think, a dangerous one. It, it, it dis, perhaps leads to disruptive living. And it's not just retirement. And, and, and another comment I'll make here. If we as a society think that we're, we work till retirement and that's it, that's damaging not just for those who are retired, it's also damaging for those who are looking forward to that. Because you've now adopted an attitude that I just need to get work out of the way so that I can now live, find the good life that I meant to have without work. But it's not, a, again, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Another comment. Is it true that even before retirement, retirement is one way of thinking this way, but uh, so others of us have other th ways of thinking too. You know, I'm going to work and then I'm going to take three years off and I'm going to work. And then th there's just all these attitudes that we have where work is just seen as a necessary evil. And maybe we don't even do that, but we, we dream of doing it. Freedom 55 or Freedom 35. Is that appropriate as Christians? Maybe it's appropriate to, to be financially stable at 35 and then use our lives to serve somebody some, some other way. But these are questions that I think we have to work through on this topic. Now, point number four. We are called to not only work, but to work diligently and industriously. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say, and particularly about diligence. I'll let you read a few of them to you. 10 verse 4, lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. 12:11, he who works his land will have abundant food, but he who chases fantasies lacks judgment. 12:24, diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. I guess in that time, if you ran out of money, you had to sell yourself into slavery. 12 verse 30, or 24 verse 30. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a bandit, and scarcity like an armed man. Ouch. And so Christians are not just called to work, but to be industrious, to do something useful with it, or risk poverty. And the Bible explicitly says... The poverty may come on those who are not diligent. And there's no promise that God will mitigate that type of poverty. There's a type of suffering that he will allow you to walk through because of your decisions. That God might mitigate your poverty because he's gracious. But Proverbs is pretty clear with what, God, what might also happen is that you just might have to face some scarcity because you didn't work. We have a role to play in being fed. Even in 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul makes a connection in a very strong way by saying the man who does not work ought not to eat. The Father in heaven provides us with food by enabling us to work the earth. And the Father provides gifts that we use to do that. And this morning we learned about the talents. God gives us talents, so he invests things in us so that we might use them for the good of the kingdom and maybe just so that we can eat. That's number four. Point five. In a sinful world, there is potential for our work to be futile and sort of meaningless at times. 
at least well, I would say human work in itself. Many of us feel this way. We work at jobs that seem lifeless. They just seem deadening. They're really boring or they're really difficult. We're not paid enough. And it seems that there's just a sense of futility. And, you know, the famous uh, Karl Marx talked about this. Karl Marx said that capitalistic labor, by forcing human beings to work in these giant factories, each with their tiny little task, he said that alienated man from his work. Man was not doing anything. Man's work had become just a way of earning money. It was not a meaningful pursuit for his soul anymore. And that is a reality in, in our sinful world, that that happens. Now, it's interesting that the Catechism says, he says, our care and labor and also your gifts cannot do us any good without your blessing. And it's a curious thing that it's possible that our work is not blessed by God. It's just sort of futile and pointless. But I think it, part of the praying for our daily bread is to pray that God would bless our work and render it meaningful. And so you can read in Psalm 127, there's a curious, if you ever read that psalm, it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. And here you have this explicit connection to how I work, and whether the Lord's blessing is on my work and whether I've invited that, affects its usefulness and, and its, it, the, the, the benefit of it and the sort of meaning of it. Or and then you have also 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. And Paul says there, Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because, why? You know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. That's interesting. It's a promise, isn't it? If you do your work in the Lord, it will have meaning. It will not be in vain. It will be useful. It will accomplish the, the ends for which God intended. And there's another one in Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And then verse 8. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So a Christian who builds his life in Jesus, in Christ, who seeks the kingdom first, this is a person who God will bless the work, the things he does with his hands. Psalm 1 talks about this too. The, the, the creations of his hands will become flourishing. His life will not be meaningless and futile. It's not to say that every job he does will have this wonderful purpose. Sometimes there will be drudgery because this is sinful life. But all of it will be fruitful. And I think one of the great blessings of the Lord is to live a fruitful, meaningful life. That's his gift to us. It's not what we have to do for him or us. He's ain't. No, it's his gift to us where he receives glory. Now, you might ask the question, well, that's fine, but I, live an uns I have a very unsatisfying job. What do I do if I don't feel fulfilled in it? Well, I think many of us need to separate our occupation from our calling. Every one of us has certain gifts. That's not the same thing as what we actually do at work. An occupation or a job is an opportunity for you to use your gifts in a particular way. It is not the only way your gifts can be used, nor is it the only work that you have to do. And we know this because I'm a father. I'm just, because I'm a father doesn't mean that I can't, like I have a calling as a minister, I have a calling as a father. We have all different callings in our lives, and they're not the same as my job. And it may be that the gifts that God is giving you are driving you towards a different type of work. Or maybe your calling as a father is to provide for your family and you have to work a drudgery, difficult job because you need to earn the money that need, you need to fulfill your calling as a father. Maybe that's the case. 
Now, there is a purpose in it. But even the most drudgery, the worst drudgery can be noble and fulfilling if we know that we're earning the money we need to feed our family. So that the meaning is not always what we think it is. And beyond that, work is bigger than our job, as I've said. But we have work as fathers. We have work as members of the church and elders in the church. And these are also types of work that we have to do. And I think if that's true, which it is based on Genesis, it seems a little bit reductionistic to think that our careers are the sum total of what work is. I think many of us have given our lives and our identity to our professional identity. And that is slightly, well, slightly, I think it's a bit pathetic, personally. And I think scripturally, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. In the Bible, people are not necessarily defined by whether they're a farmer or whatnot. No, they're defined, first of all, by being members of Christ, members of the church, and a farmer doesn't have to be a farmer his whole life. He can switch, stop being a farmer and become an construction worker. Does he lose his identity then? No. Like that, you see, that doesn't work. And often those who make their work, their whole identity, their home life becomes utter ruin. And joy disappears. It's, it's because doing that, identifying yourself with the objects or the, that you create or the paper that you push is dehumanizing. I remember a story that my friend told me one time. He worked at a company as an engineer. There was maybe 100 engineers at this company. And engineers are sort of, you know, I don't want to knock engineers too much, but although it's easy to do, right? It's sort of this wooden kind of, I go to work, I do my job, I go home, you know, I eat, I come back. It's something comes on sometimes kind of robotic in engineers. And in this company, this was really the case. And one day my friend went, was raising money for a Christian cause. And he went to his boss. And he asked his boss for money to help this cause. And his boss was stunned. He said, wow, you have a life outside of work. I'm astonished. And he said, somebody in this company actually, is, their life is bigger than building this company. And his boss was impressed. And what's striking about the story is that the boss actually formed a different company not soon after, and he only invited five employees to come with him. And my friend was one of them, because my boss only wanted people who were human beings, not just these robots that you plug into the machine to do CAD. And it, it was an interesting case of where, because my friend had a life that was human, where he had family and friends and charities that he was supporting and volunteering, that actually helped advance his career. You would never have thought that. You would have think that working harder would have been the way, but it wasn't. This is, I think, a little bit of an example of how dehumanizing careers can become. And it's actually not always beneficial in the long run for your career itself. The producing, we could say this very simply, the producing of food, and this is biblically, is being important, does not supersede family or church or friends, or people. And there's work in building relationships, and work in building marriages, and work in raising children. These things are not, you're, you're producing food does not supersede that. It's one part of it. Now, one more point before we go home. This is Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7. I'll read, I'll read it to you. It says this. Go eat your food with gladness and drink your wine with a joyful heart for God has already approved what you do. And then verse 9. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, for in the realm of the dead, where you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. 
What's fascinating is that to the teacher in Ecclesiastes, he's talking about what the meaning of life is. And in Ecclesiastes, the meaning of life, first and foremost, is to serve God and obey his commands. But secondly, there's another layer. And he says it here. Another layer is to enjoy life while you have it. Eat and drink in gladness. Work and enjoy your work, for that is a gift from God. Look at verse 5, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 19. When God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. God wants us to be happy in our, to enjoy our work. He does not, yes, he cursed work, but I think part of being a Christian is being restored by Christ, and part of the restoration of Christ is to have work become enjoyable, and to then, the, what we earn, we enjoy. God wants that. He likes it. We don't have to become all serious as if we have to hate our lives and no God wants our work to gladden our hearts and it's a gift when it does we don't have to apologize for our work or put, even push our work to the margins or become people who think that work is unimportant no work is a, is a big part of our identity how we do our careers is not unimportant it does it matters a significant amount and to find work that we enjoy is a noble pursuit. And that's, that's encouraging. Maybe for some of us it's not encouraging because we don't have enjoyable work, maybe. But if, I think it's encouraging that that's where God wants us to go and that if we seek that out, it may be something that he gives us. Well, I hope that's encouraging. God wants us to, and, and to enjoy the fruit of our labors. To, like, one of the things about Ecclesiastes is that one of the major meanings in life is to live well in the present. Every meal ought to be an, a place of joy. Just every opportunity to enjoy a meal with, a, like we just had the potluck, but to eat with brothers and sisters is an opportunity to be glad. It's a beautiful thing. That's one of the ways, one of the great meanings of life is just to enjoy the present. For God gave it to us. Well, this is all I, I have today as far as theology of work. There's more to say, and I, uh, it, it's, uh, I think I'm going to do another sermon potentially on it. The big question that we have to deal with yet that I don't have time to deal with because I realize it's a huge subject the great question that I think we have to deal with yet on work has to do with um, work versus rest. We work and then we rest. And how do we understand the two in uh, relation to each other? We are not meant to work all the time. And God does not work all the time. God works and then he rests. And interestingly, the seventh day, there's no end to God's rest. So what does that mean? And uh, I want to think more about that. I didn't have time to put it in this sermon. But uh, I think in time we'll get to it. Maybe, maybe not next time, but I want to keep thinking that through. Because that is something our culture struggles with too. And we struggle with too. Can we rest? Are we allowed to rest? Do we, should we feel guilty when we rest? Um, how much do we rest? How little do we rest? How does, what is that? But I think we'll get to that a different day. But today we can say... Yes, we are meant to work. It's a good thing to work. And God will give us joy in our work and he will give us meaning in our work. And especially if we ask for it. And uh, our work can be a great pleasure as long as it doesn't consume all of our life. And if we don't let certain types of work become so primary that we neglect others. But beyond that, work at the end of the day is something that Christ did too. And as we work, we can remember that Christ worked and the biggest part of his work was to save you because he works in heaven to save us and if when he worked when he was on earth to suffer and die which is part of his work all of us can have rest in eternity with God 
And so praise God that Jesus Christ works and that his work is complete and total and that nothing can change it or alter it and that his work is given for the, your flourishing. And here we have the center of work. And may we now work in that reality, giving praise to him in that. Amen.